Hey folks, Mark again with Backwood Basics. Today I want to talk about using our bucket planter system, our self-watering bucket planters, to grow some watermelons. Because uh, today's June 12th, and this morning it was 37 degrees. Yesterday morning I think it was 42. The morning before it was in the low 40s, 42, 43. Anyways, it's a struggle this year. <laughs> In nine days, the days are going to be getting shorter again, so it's kind of tough to grow melons here in northern Minnesota. So I got these seeds, and I really want to give them a try, and so I'm going to grow watermelon in these bucket planters, and then we're going to set up some, uh, some cantaloupe, too, so I'll... Uh, I'll show you what these seeds are here. Now, hopefully that'll focus. So these Honey Island melons are going to go in here. So the bucket system uses vinyl tubing split tubing which allows water to go from bucket to bucket without clogs, without the roots and potting mix, debris, clogging the flow of water from, from bucket to bucket. So I'm going to set this up by inserting vinyl tubing through these 3 8 inch grommets. And then sticking the, uh, the split tubing, sliding it over. Now this is the terminal one, so I don't have a grommet on the other side. So this one will just lay here. And then as I get all of them installed, what I'll do is put in one of our folded oval inserts. Now these are the ones, and there are other videos showing how to assemble all of this, how to drill the holes, how to insert the grommet and everything. Now these inserts are something that we came up with, and this is like the third incarnation of them. The first ones were, were really not strong enough. This is corrugated polypropylene. And then we had a next generation. They were a little wobbly in there. They didn't quite fit. So these we did last year, we trialed, and they work good. They work well enough, but because there are a lot of hydraulic forces, the roots, between the roots and the water, and then the water itself softens this material. Because these, the, the bottom parts sit in water then for the entire growing season for three or four months. So they're probably not our final answer, but they work well enough. So. We, we will have these available, a bucket kit that includes the float valve box and all the tubing and everything else. And we're going to throw a half a dozen of these inserts in at no cost and to get through this growing season. And then next year we're looking at trying to beef these things up with a, uh, a, a double the thickness. But what we do then is just slide that insert in. So that it makes a tent in the bottom. And then the peaks of that insert line up with these air holes. Now those provide aeration for the roots from underneath. And they also serve as an overflow. If we were doing this outdoors on, without being in a hoop house, there'd be the potential for rainwater flooding them. And that keeps the water level from getting too high. So I'm going to get this thing set up and then we're going to come back and, and take a look at this as we go th forward through the process. What I have done is put all of the tubing in, all of the vinyl tubing through the grommets, and then all of the split tubing over those vinyl tubing ends in each of these buckets. Now these are all buckets that I used last year. I got for a dollar a piece from our local grocery store. And 
then there's a float valve box that's attached to the first bucket. And that, in this case, we're going to attach to a about a 20 gallon tote. Now this tote I used last year, but it contains all of the supplies, everything that I used last year. So virtually all of this stuff is reusable. All of the tubing, the split tubing, the circling stoppers, the float boxes, I just store them in one of, the, one of these and then and then reuse them. Now possibly the inserts aren't, which is not a huge issue, but it's they're cheap enough, but uh, we're hoping we can get inserts that'll, that'll last for several seasons. They are recyclable, polypropylene, so it's not, could be worse, I guess. So these are six, these are uh, three gallon pots that the manufacturer no longer makes, which I wish we'd have known before we had about 400 inserts made for them, but that's business. So I have tomatoes that I repotted in these that are connected to this float box. And I only hooked up six to those, and then another six to this float box. And the reason I didn't string 12 together using just one float box is because with tomatoes, it's a little bit like the Colorado River, you know, where everybody's using the water, and so by the time it gets to the Gulf of California, there isn't any water left. So when these tomato plants get to the point where they're trellised up to the top of the hoop house, 12 of them use quite a bit of water. So those poor guys at the end don't get quite enough. So with tomatoes, I decided that six is plenty. Now these are connected by hoses to our, our rain barrels. And these are our homemade rain barrels, 55 gallon drums, two of them plumbed together. As you can see underneath here, I just used bulkhead fittings and plumbed them together and then they're connected to a faucet with an elaborate assortment of Y connectors. Now we have to keep a screen in each of these hoses because these homemade buckets, barrels, are uh, tend to accumulate debris, you know, quite a bit of debris, so they'll clog up that mini float valve if you don't, don't put a screen in there. But I'm gonna do a video, we have another rain barrel that we purchased. I'm gonna do a video here shortly on my thoughts on homemade versus a commercially made rain barrel. Here we have 13 planters. We have some of those three gallon ones and then these are our four gallon square planters which we still have. Uh, we're going to have these available locally. I don't think we'll be shipping those because they really get you on the shipping costs. But in this case, we strung all 13 together with one float valve connected to the rain barrel because peppers and eggplant don't use nearly the amount of water that tomatoes do. So here's six more tomato plants connected to a float box. And then up here we have our six habanadas, a heatless habanero. And these were so tiny that most people would have just thrown them out. I mean, they were virtually, <laughs> uh, didn't even really have true leaves on them, but they're coming along. And despite being in the 30s and 40s at night, and today it's after 11 o'clock and it's still in the 50s here and, you know, nice and balmy in the hoop house, but it's a struggle. But we want these habanadas to really ripen this year and we want to save our seeds back. We get these from Fruition Seeds out in, I, I believe, Naples, New York, out in the Finger Lakes area. Uh, just an incredible pepper. We'll talk more about those later too. Next we fold the inserts into the all of the planters. I'm trying to do one-handed here. 
So they just fold and sit seat right down in the bottom. You just want to get them so the peaks line up with those air holes, overflow holes that are on each side. And then we will install our circling stoppers as we fill them with potty mix. So we'll talk about these handy little things here in a bit. But what we're going to fill them with is a mixture of half a commercial potting mix. And we use Pro Mix Organic, basically a peat-based potting mix, kind of a necessary evil. Mixed with some of our own compost. Now this composter has been running since winter. We actually didn't have the cover on so we let it freeze. But we're going to sift out what's in this composter to add to our potting mix by using this contraption. For sifting compost, I like to use the low speed. It just kind of slowly lets this material tumble and so the, the big st stinky dung beetle balls will roll down. As long as it keeps going slowly like that, it, uh, it doesn't fling the stuff all over the place. So I still have some chopped leaves that I put in not too long ago and uh, eggshells that didn't decompose and all of that. Stems and whatnot. But kind of slow and easy and What's accumulating in here, we'll take a look at it here in a bit, but it's the nice stuff. So you know when you see those those uh, ads for the folks that sell these rotating drum composters and they open it up and they pull out this stuff that's just this beautiful, rich, looks like our potting mix. I don't know, I think that might be a little staged. But what's coming out of the screen in the bottom does pretty much look like that. And that's what we're going to use to mix with our potting mix to put in our self-watering planters. So while I have this thing here, I'm going to go ahead and clean out that whole composter. And everything that tumbles out the end, I'm going to put back in. And then we'll refill it. So. We'll meet back and fill those planters in a bit. This is what we sifted out of that composter. And so we are just going to add some of that to our potting mix. And I think it's probably, oh, I'd say probably close to a two to one, two parts potting mix to one part of our compost. We go sometimes as high as 50-50, but this stuff's not completely composted, so I think we're going to stick to a, a two to one. So we'll go fill those, those planters. I mixed up the potting mix so that I have the uh, compost. It actually ended up being closer to 50-50 than I thought. Compost and potting mix. and. What I did then is filled all the buckets, and it's hard to see probably because the water is so clear and the buckets are white. But each bucket has probably about an inch and a half of water in the bottom. So the water collects at the bottom where it will wick up. And then at the top part, that's where the airspace is. So our inserts work to make a bucket a self-watering planter. And then I set the float valve. It's pretty much ready to shut off. It's just dripping now. So that the this will regulate the water so that the water level in each of the buckets will be the same as what's in this chamber and will keep it at about that height. And then I swapped out the, uh, the 
coat. I just I found one that I'd used outside last summer, the last couple summers. And so it's filled it's filled now with rainwater. Okay, so a couple reasons why I chose to use a tote here instead of simply just hooking this float box up to the rain barrels like I did to all the other ones. Well, a couple of reasons. One is I like to use this as a reservoir. Say I'm expecting rain and I can fill these totes and then rather than have all my barrels just overflow, I can store some more of the rainwater. Now the other reason is because later in the season, when these plants are big and they start setting fruit, they might need a little boost. And that's when we add maybe a 50% a dilute hydroponic solution or even a full strength hydroponic solution, which isn't all that much, a tablespoon of nutrient solution per gallon of water. And it's kind of like an IV, kind of like intensive care for our plants. And once we do that, then they really take off. So once these start setting fruit, we can do what I call hybrid hydroponics and boost our plants at the end of the growing season. So we'll get these planted here and move on to the next thing. What I'm doing is putting a scoop, a good scoop of the potting mix into the bottom of each of the planters and then just kind of gently gently push it down into those areas where it's going to wick the water up. So now they each have a scoop and now I'm going to install the circling stoppers. Now these I put in at the peaks of the inserts, one on each side of the bucket. And all they are, if you haven't seen the other videos on this, is the corner bead that you use to protect the corners when you're sheet rocking, drywalling. And they're an eight foot length, about a dollar and a quarter or dollar fifty or something. And I just found that they eliminate circling of roots around the containers. You know what happens when a root hits the hard exterior? It just turns and keeps going in a circle, thinking it's still going in a straight line. It'll just keep going and going and going. Whereas here, not only when it hits that circling stopper is there a physical barrier, but because they're perforated and there's air in here, it does some root pruning, you know, that it will start to desiccate, dry those terminal ends of those roots, and they respond by branching out. And if you see the videos and pictures that I have of the root masses when you pull the plants out of here at the end of the season, it's really something to behold. And I have seen no circling of roots. Those roots just absolutely find every speck of nutrients in that, in that potting mix and they really maximize the efficiency just by using a simple thing like this. So give it a try. If you're planting in containers, just go to the building supply store, get some corner bead like that, cut them up to size and, and give it a try. So anyways, those get installed after the first bit of potting mix and then We'll go ahead and secure them with the rest of the potting mix. And then we'll go ahead and fill them up. We're not going to fill them to the top because I'm going to probably augment these during the growing season with some compost or with some worm castings. And then I also cover them once the plants emerge and are well established with a mulch of chopped leaves. So I'll do this with all of them and then what I do before planting is this is just the initial time. Give that potting mix a good a good soaking and that kind of primes the pump. From then on water is going to wick up from the bottom 
and you'll never have to water these things again the whole growing season. Really a slick way to go. Oh, by, by the way, before I forget that, that opening scene, I had the telephoto lens on the camera just uh, reminded me there was a deer out in the pasture, which is no big deal. They're always there. But right behind it was a turkey. And that is kind of a big deal for up here because it hasn't been too many years. A turkey in northern Minnesota was unheard of. And last year we had seven of them running around. And I was kind of amazed to see one because we had such a severe winter. We had uh, 44 below. Our propane tank froze. We had snow close to... 30 inches of snow out there on the pasture for most of the winter. Heavy, heavy snowfall. I cannot imagine how these turkeys survive, but apparently somebody's feeding them. Anyways, if you can see it, I thought that was kind of cool. So I'm just going to plant these out. I'm going to plant three melon seeds in each pot. Each pot's considered a hill as far as I'm concerned. And then we'll check back here in a couple weeks and a few weeks and see how they're coming up. In the meantime, I have lots of other things I want to show you. So I'm going to ask if you like this kind of stuff, we enjoy bringing it to you. We enjoy sharing ideas. We enjoy hearing what you folks are up to. And so we'd really appreciate it if you would like us, if you like this video, and if you would subscribe to the Backwood Basics channel. And if you would do that for us, I will do my part to try to bring you concise, informative, and inspirational videos on doing some pretty cool stuff up here in the North Woods. So until then, this is Mark with Backwood Basics. And let's grow together. <laughs>